I'm David Nutt, and uh, I'm a psychiatrist, neuropsychopharmacologist, uh, working at Imperial College. And a lot of my professional life, I've been trying to bring science to drug policy. And this talk is uh, a culmination of uh, about 20 years of thinking deeply about the nature of the problems of drugs and drug harms and how to minimize them. Uh, and as you'll see from the title, I believe decriminalization is the way forward. And I'll give a little plug for my new book on the right here. You see the, the second edition of Drugs Without the Hot Air, which uh, goes into uh, the rationale and the, uh, and the science behind this particular talk in much more detail. And importantly, all the proceeds of that book uh, support my charity, Drug Science. This is an image of me being sacked by the government. I used to be the government's chief drugs advisor uh, and was sacked in 2009 uh, by Alan Johnson. And the reason I was sacked is, was because I was arguing that current drug policies are evidence-based. And uh, there was a particular uh, obsession with drugs such as MDMA and uh, new psychoactive substances uh, and cannabis uh, to the... Uh, I think as almost deliberately producing a smokescreen to avoid confronting the drugs which are particularly still the most damaging in the UK, which are alcohol and tobacco. And that's really shown rather well with the scales of justice in the bottom left-hand corner. And uh, at the time, I thought I was right, but I argued that cannabis was unfairly penalised. So subsequently, I was proved right because no... Lesser authority than President Obama said so. And uh, in a remarkable speech where he, for the first time, admitted that US policy on drugs was actually, had been wrong, and that cannabis should become legal, at least be allowed as a medicine, in, as it is now in over 31 US states. And he said, because it's no more dangerous than alcohol. And I would completely agree with him. But it's still illegal under federal law, and it's still illegal in this country. And why is that? Well, it's because we provide, we, we currently uh, have a use reduction prohibitionist approach. So I want to talk about some of the terms, which is very important that people understand the terms we're using. Criminalization prohibition is uh, the general way in which drugs which are illegal are controlled around the world. And... Basically, possession or use of a drug in some countries, not in the UK, thankfully, is a crime that can be punished by criminal sanctions, including the death penalty in some countries. Depenalization or decriminalization is what I'm going to argue is the right way forward. And this means no criminal sanctions. You can apply civil sanctions. For instance, if you catch someone with a, a drug which is decriminalized, you can fine them, you can withhold their driving license. You can often, as they do in Portugal, use what they call dissuasion processes to help people understand the harms of using those drugs. Um, but you don't get a criminal sanction, so you don't drive uh, the criminal uh, underworld. Legalization generally is taken to mean anything from a fully open market where you can sell any drug to anyone, which is rare in the world, but I suppose in some parts of uh, the favelas in South America, uh, most things are available if you want. Or it could mean a regulated market like we have currently with alcohol uh, and tobacco in Britain, where there are age limits and safety limits. So bear those terms in mind as we go through uh, my talk. So I'm going to argue that decriminalization is the right approach for a number of reasons. The first is it avoids the massive damages that criminalization produces. The second is that decriminalization is actually proportionate to the health harms of drugs. The third is it, that it will greatly facilitate research and clinical innovation. And the fourth is it works. We know from over 40 years of decriminalization of cannabis and nearly 18 years of decriminalizing all drugs in Portugal that this approach works. So let's look at the current policy that we have in Britain. Well, it's a punishment-based policy. And uh, the first is it's biased about the drugs which we control. It's dishonest and therefore immoral. We don't control tobacco, we don't control alcohol, but we control other drugs, which I'm going to argue are actually less harmful. So this makes it a peculiarly uh, dishonest and 
in effective policy. One of the reasons we have this uh, peculiarity of uh, uh, almost what you might call sort of scientific nihilism about drug policies is there is no definition either in the UN conventions or in the UK Drugs Act about what a drug is or who should say what a drug is. And basically that means that it's left to politicians, to newspapers and the drinks industry to define what a drug is. And of course they do it not based on harms or risks, but based on political or economic benefits. So here is a wonderful example of how the drinks industry alters people's perceptions as what a drug is. Say no to drugs, that way you'll have more time to drink. Now, of course, everyone knows that alcohol is a drug, but it isn't controlled as a drug under the Misuse of Drugs Act. Why not? Because historically, it's been exempt. Why? Because people like to drink. And the drinks industry has done its very best to make sure that people don't understand the risks of drink. Uh, and uh, they often distort the harms of other drugs uh, and try to minimize the harms of alcohol. So my definition of a drug is here, uh, something a politician once used but now regrets. And a couple of examples in my career, uh, Jackie Smith, the Home Secretary, I locked swords with over the comparative harms of ecstasy versus horse riding. She said, I smoked cannabis, but I didn't enjoy. And you think, well, why would you bother? But uh, maybe you had to do that to get into the Labour Party in uh, Oxford when she was there. David Cameron, I did things when young I shouldn't have. We all did. And the great thing about David, he tended to do drugs which began with the same letter as his name, C. Uh, drugs like cannabis and cocaine. Um, so we know there's a strong tradition of politicians using drugs. We've had this recent example, for instance, of uh, Michael Gove having been quite into cocaine parties. But he now regrets that, and, but he's very glad he wasn't caught and wasn't imprisoned for it. When we're looking at drugs and drug policy, what are we trying to do? Well, we are trying, most of us would argue, to reduce harms. And well, perhaps the most important, significant harm of uh, a drug is, is death. And here are the latest data we have on deaths from different drugs. On the left-hand side, you see tobacco, over 80,000 premature deaths. Alcohol, about 28,000. Opiates reached all-time high last year of nearly 18,000. Uh, 1,800, sorry. And then cocaine, paracetamol, and fetamine ecstasy. So the big killers are tobacco. Some economists say that... Um, uh, T tobacco deaths don't really matter. They're called what they call good deaths because people who smoke pay a lot of tax during their lifetime and then they die before they can draw their pensions. So actually they, they're net contributors to the economy. Whereas alcohol deaths are, are much more spread out across the age range and they do have a very powerful impact on young people. And then opiates are the third. So these are the three big killers. And uh, you might have think that those would be the drugs we wanted to focus most of our attention on. But in fact, largely the hysteria that you read about drugs in the newspaper and the media is focused on drugs that are on the right-hand side, ecstasy and cannabis, etc., which have very low levels of harm. And one of the most remarkable studies I was involved with in was this one, which was published about 10 years ago now in The Lancet, and it was the most systematic analysis of drug harms that had ever been done. We determined that there were 16 different harms of drugs, and we took these 20 drugs and scaled them on these 16 harms. Nine of the harms are the harms to the user, and seven of the harms are harms to society. And the harms to the user are scaled as according to the blue bars, and the harms to society as the red bar. And you can see that when you put the two together, alcohol is at the top of the list, because alcohol has such enormous impact on other people. Alcohol damages almost every single family in this country through either the economic cost or the, the child abuse, the damage, uh, the, the violence in families or the road traffic accidents, etc. that alcohol produces. It's not the most harmful drug to the user. That is to the right of alcohol. You see heroin, crack cocaine, crystal meth. They're more harmful to the user, but they're much less widely used. So it's the, it's the fact that up to about 80% of adults use alcohol. It makes alcohol the most harmful drug. And, and that is a very important consideration because we do want to try to minimize harms. And alcohol should be the drug that we really focus our attention on 
But as I say, it's eliminated from misuse of drugs act and it's avoided most politicians will avoid trying to do something about alcohol. One of the things we discovered when we uh, finished this piece of work was that to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.